All right. So uh, we're going to talk about something about data and big data. You know, we are in big, like, big data Spain. And we're going to talk about two things. One more about culture, methodologies, how to work in data teams. The other one is more technical, more about uh, technology and implementation. So my name is Jose Manuel Navarro. I'm the CTO of Urban Data Analytics. And this is Luis, my teammate, lead data engineer. And I will do the part of more technology, more culture, and he will do the, the technology one. So first, some context about ourselves, our company, our uh, status, then the culture, the solution, the technology we are implementing, and finally, the end. So who is uh, Urban Data Analytics? We are a company to give tools and data to improve the decision-making process to, home your, to buy your, your home. And don't screw it up, as I did in my previous life. So, you know, buying a house is an important decision. Do it well for your own future. We do tools like this. You do a lot of maps using a lot of technologies. We do some of data uh, engineering. We do a lot of things all related to real estate uh, industry. We can be in the very top of this uh, analytics pyramid, you know, from descriptive, diagnosis, predictive, and, and prescription, we try to do prescription to our customers, our users. This, pre this prescription is more like, uh, should I buy this house or should I rent it? Okay. How does our data look like? Okay. First dimension, our data is arranged in three dimensions, three axes. The first one is, where is the data located? Where is the apartment you want to buy? Where is the uh, flat you want to rent? Uh, in this dimension, we have different uh, administrative units, geo units, like the country, the, the state, the city, the neighborhood. So we can go up or down in, this, in these dimensions. The second dimension is when. When happens the operation? When do you want to buy? When do you want to rent? For so, how many times? Maybe for years, maybe for months. In this dimension, we can arrange in different units. We can uh, make analysis by year, by quarter, by month. Okay. And the last one is what? What do you want to buy? Do you want uh, an apartment? Do you want a garage? What, what do you want to sell? Okay. And uh, in the, for the same typology of, of the asset, how does it like? Uh, is it small? Uh, two bedrooms? Okay. So. One of our typical questions we want to solve is like this. How many two-bedroom apartments were sold last month near Plaza Mayor? In this question, we have the three dimensions. What do you want, where do you want, and when do you want? OK, this is the context. And how, does, how is our team? Our team is very small. We are a 15-people company, but we have a wide range of of profiles of people, different people working for in our company. One is domain experts, the business analysts, marketers, data scientists, GIS engineers, and software engineers. So for a very small company, this is a very diverse ecosystem. And in one typical day in our company, we can say something like this. OK, guys, please send this data to the user. And OK, this is a fair question or fair command. And Depending on the, the guy, you can interpret this in different ways. The first one is, OK, a domain expert interpret it like, OK, I'm going to prepare a PowerPoint presentation, and I will go to the offices and present it to them. And the deliverable will be something like this. Then the business analyst for the same question has a different understanding. I will create an Excel file, and I will send it by email. OK. It does, it does looks like this. And the marketers say, I will send a newsletter. It does great. And he, and he sends the newsletter. The data scientist says, hey, wait, I'm going to prepare a notebook, and I will do my analysis, and I will send the results. And he pre uh, prepares all the stuff. And 
Then the GIS engineer says, hey, I have a map. Uh, we are going to present those data in a map, and that will be great. And then they, they send the map. And finally, the software engineer says, ah, I've got an API. Just send them the API. And the deliverable will be something like this. So for the same question, we have very different answers. And we have a very big tower of Babel. So you know, we sometimes don't understand. We sometimes have a different understanding on the same fact, or the same question. But all answers are valid. No, none of them are invalid. Just, it's just a different interpretation of the question. So this is an issue for us, and this is a challenge to solve. So what we have, or we had in the beginning of this process, we had a lack of understanding. So same question, different interpretations. Everything we did was ad hoc. We created analysis again and again and again for different customers' use cases, and we didn't reduce mostly nothing. So we, we struggled doing repeatability. So we, we didn't achieve to use the same analysis for the next, uh, next, the next uh, contracts. The results were, were inconsistent because we tried to, to do the same and next week tried to repeat and it was inconsistent. And everything was manually verified. So we had a lot of hours checking and checking and checking our results and making sure that the result is, is, co uh, is valid. This leads to high response times, frequent errors, and a lot of hours spending on, on the work. The result of all of this, this is very difficult to scale. So we had a very big problem, and we need to solve it. The revelation for us was these two books. The, the, this one in the left side is written by some very uh, industry gurus. Michael Stonebreaker is the creator of Postgres, so that's enough for me. And the other guys are in Facebook, and they created a, the data platform for Facebook. So I think they, they know what they say. And for us, it was a revelation because it gave us a new uh, point to move towards. This point is a new buzzword in the industry, and it's called data ops. You know, buzzwords are great, but there is a lot of meaning the, behind some bad words. Data ops is a new methodology to implement in data teams. Some definitions. The Wikipedia says that data ops is an automated process-oriented methodology used by analytics and data teams to improve the quality and reduce the time. Right? That looks great and fits uh, very good for our, uh, our challenges. Another different definition is data ops is an approach to build a self-service data platform. That's also great because sometimes we had a lot of requests, internal requests, asking for data, asking for analysis, asking for things, and we need to give, okay, do it yourself. Data ops is a methodology consisting on people, processes, and tools. Three things align in the same direction for enterprise to rapidly, repeatedly, and reliably deliver production-ready data. Okay, that's a very nice definition. You know, data ops is something that is being created by the industry. There is not a single thing. There are also different interpretations about data ops. So the main ideas for us after reading these books are, okay, everything automated, or most things automated, everything rapid and and put effort in achieving a speed. Quality and reliability, you need to make sure and have confidence about your data and your processes. Everything repeatable, you cannot repeat by hand everything, all the process over and over again. And finally, self-service. Don't be a blocker. Don't, uh, don't require, require others to ask you things, to ask for things. I want it all. I want it all. I want it all. And I want it now. That's the point. We want it all, and I want it now. So it's very difficult in a data uh, department, a data team, 
to have all of these things, repeatability, quality, speed, everything automated, and in very, very short uh, time. So DataOps aims to go to, to this approach. So DataOps comes from joining three different disciplines or, or worlds in the, in the industry. One is the data world, other is the software development, and the other is the infrastructure. As you probably guess, data ops comes from DevOps. In this, case, in this intersection, we have other disciplines and best practices, like business intelligence, big data, and DevOps. And data ops tries to gather everything together, get the best practices of all of this, and put it in the same unified methodology for data analytics teams and challenges. So data house is in the middle of everything. So just going to the point, key practices. You know, you have the culture, and then you need some practice to implement in your teams. These are the practices. We are going very fast through all of them. First, productize all your processing. You cannot need to write one code for one analysis, and the, next and the following week, write again the same code. For instance, you need to do an analysis, and you don't hard code the parameters, the input values. You always write abstract or generic code asking for parameters. Very, very basic, right? But most of the times, uh, some analysis are doing like the left. The goal, reuse your code. If you write three lines of code, make sure that those lines can be reduced. Don't throw them away. Second, test your data. Very basic, also. Our analysis, our job is mostly transformations. Getting some input data, transform it, and put in some output. The output is different data, or visualizations, or whatever. Test the input data and test the output data. That's very basic. It's common sense. And also, test the code. Just use unit testing, integration testing, whatever. But make sure that your code does what it is meant to do. When you do a real job, you don't do only one transformation. You have a pipeline of transformations or a chain. Again, test the input data, test the output data. In the middle, test the intermediate steps. So you are, you are making sure that all the steps are going right. And finally, test your code. Make sure that your code does what it does, what we need to do. Run your task, your test frequently and automatically. You don't need to push a button. You don't need someone to remember, oh, I need to run my test. No. Put a platform and run constantly. We have Hudson or Jenkins, sorry. Measure your process, third key practice. In every step of your pipeline, you are doing a lot of things. You are getting some data, you are producing all the data. Collect metrics all of, uh, in all of those steps. A very basic metric is just the round count. You just count the round count in the beginning and in the end of the uh, transformation. And just store it. When you have the, store, uh, the metrics stored, you can then visualize trends or maybe some uh, subtle change in the data or some values out of expected range. That's very basic to detect early problems. Second, next uh, practice, version control. Very, very, very basic. But you can be surprised that uh, a lot of uh, data scientists or data teams still don't use uh, version control. For instance, you still get some emails with data and source code. Oh my god, put it in the repo. Make a commit and send me the commit. Represent everything as code, as, as much as possible. Represent data modifications as code. If you uh, represent a data modification as code, instead of just running the, uh, SQL in the, in the database, you can track that data modification and check if it is run or not, and, and create modifications and so on. Represent the schema modifications also. Represent the infrastructure. How many servers do I need to run this pipeline? Maybe this guy knows. No. Go to the text, go to the source code, and check it. 
and represent also sample data sets. Hey, guys, I have to do a demo. I need some sample data. Can you give it to me? No. You are self-service. Go to the repo and get the data set. Also enable parallel development. Uh, very basic, basic also. Git is great doing branching and merging. Do it by your own advantage. Next, support several environments. Also, common sense. My god, who is, has only one database? Only the production database. We had that. And who does this? We did that. So always, we, when we are in Rust, you say, OK, hey, guys, this data is wrong. Fix it. Right, run. OK, go. Production. SQL. Hey, fixed. No, no more. Not anymore. Create a data migration. Apply it in your uh, environment, in your pre-production environment, or first in your development environment. Check if everything is all right. Then apply it to the pre-production environment. Check if everything is all right. And then run it in a production environment. OK? We cannot screw it up in production environments, so that's why you need several environments. So data migrations are very, very basic. And you need, again, test to, to check that every data migration is consistent in every environment. And you need to replicate those environments. So if you have a very bright environment in production, but the pre-production environment is different and your development environment is different, you have a mess and, and uh, nothing is, uh, is consistent. So you need to replicate across environments. The data, the structure, the schema, everything. Next practice, containerization. So since Docker, uh, everything changed a lot. And now we have a way to move uh, processing or move whole programs between or across uh, environments. A container, as you know, is an atomic unit of execution with all of the dependencies, libraries, binaries, resources, everything you, you need to run a process or a pipeline or, a, or whatever is inside the container. So you can move the container from one environment to the other. In our case, if you think twice, an ETL is just a chain of programs. Each program receives an output, an input, uh, makes some transformations, and produces an, out an output. If the output, output is the input of the next step. In our case, those are Docker containers. Next, deploy frequently and without fear. You can probably make deploys like this. Yeah, just one deploy per month. That's right. A lot of changes the first day of the month. A lot of risk also. Probably you are going to break a lot of things, and probably you are going to spend a lot of time tracking those uh, errors. OK, let's go one deploy per week. But not bad. You will have more control deploys, smaller with less errors and less risk. But go to the very, very radical uh, place, which is one deploy or more than one deploy per day. Just when you finish a task, verified it at the end, and deployed it to the production. That's the continuous deployment environment. And last, the democratize your data. We are usually, as, as a developers or in the data departments, we are usually as uh, waiters. Someone needs a data, ask for it, and we as waiters go and send the data to that guy. But that's not, that doesn't scale. So if you are having 100 people asking for data, how many waiters do you need? A lot of waiters. So go to a different approach. Go to the self-service. Write tools, write dashboards, write back office to, uh, environments, write whatever, just to make sure that all the, your data is self-service. Anyone in the company can consume that data without asking for it. So all of this together is what data ops means, but we created a data platform just to implement all of these ideas inside our infrastructure. So Luis is going to talk to you about this data platform. OK, thank you. <coughs> so as my pal said, uh, we have a lot of problems inside our company. And we try to solve it uh, using 
the data ops uh, ideas. So before talking about what I'm doing, um, I want to tell you a story, OK? So this is uh, one day in our company. So this is Theodore, and he wants to be a developer. Hello, Theodore. Good job. So it's very fancy. So OK, they say today is Tuesday. No, they start, he starts, but today is Wednesday. But uh, OK, it's Tuesday. Let's say it's Tuesday, and we need to load uh, the data in our system. So we have uh, providers, and we need to load the data from the providers in our system. So let's do it. Let's see what happened. So first, download the files by hand as CDS. OK, next, we need to execute a script by hand. And this script uh, is a doc. It transforms the files in something that we don't know. And the results, we need to move to another folder in another server, once again, by hand. And then we execute uh, our ETL to make the transformations and load the data in our system with the Django. Uh, I don't like it. <laughs> so why we're using the Django to make the transformations is by using scripts to do transformations. OK, we don't know. But OK, we continue and we wait. One hour, two hours, what is happening? Uh, I'm bored, yes, OK. Half day waiting. And then it fails. Why? Why it is failing? Why it is failing? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to be crazy. It's failing. I waste four hours of our life waiting for a script that is failing. So, came over. <laughs> so this guy needs to start again and see what is failing, and uh, we are losing our time. So, what problem that we have? Everything is manual. So we have a guy uh, pressing every day the button to see what is happening. I do one step, press the button to the next one. I finish one step, push again the button. So if something is wrong, uh, maybe we can change it, but the guy is all the time monitoring the system to see that everything is fine. So the guy is not working. So it's only monitoring and pressing a button. And another problem, uh, DTL is 100% in batch. So this is not really a problem, but it's a problem when uh, maybe we need two days to have a complete data set to process the data. If we spend two days waiting for the data and we lose one day to process this data, we waste a lot of time waiting to the result. So this is not fine. And we thought, OK, we need to change this and create uh, something based in, in a streaming. But I'm talking to, to that later. And it's not multiprocess. So we don't have only one provider. We have multiple providers. If we spend uh, a minimum of four hours for each provider, maybe we need one week to have all the data. If it fails, maybe two weeks. So we are wasting maybe one month to have all the data. Uh, no, that's wrong. And big problems. Django. Django is not executing, uh, let's say, Python code. Django, Python, no. It is executing SQL scripts. And we don't have rollbacks. <laughs> so uh, if one script fails, what is happening? Uh, it continues fails everything, it continues with the net script with uh, incorrect values. And the thing that is worse, if we have uh, invalid values, these values are loaded in our system. So we are working with incorrect values. OK, horrible. We are, we are dead. And of course, we don't have uh, traceability, no insulations. It's not atomic. We don't know what is happening. We can roll back. We don't know, we don't know anything. And the other big problem. Uh, this is horrible. If we have the same file that we executed the script, maybe we have different results. That does not make sense. So we need to change it, and we have it to do it now. So this is the data house values that my panel said before, and we fail in all of them. So our goal is to do all these eight points. So. We need to change, we need to improve, and we need to be proud of our job. And we need to rock. So, OK, one spoiler. If someone close your eyes, don't listen, because, OK, 
we are not going about uh, disrupting technologies or something fancy ideas. Uh, we are only talking about what we're trying to do to improve our our day. And of course, the only one that we want is be proud of our jobs and say, okay, this is running, this is working, and it's cool. So um, the idea is that, so it's ITL, I sorry. <laughs> Uh, we have sources from providers, and we read it. We store in our data lake. That right now we have a data lake. Uh, two months ago, we have nothing. We have all the files in our personal computers. So amazing. And then we make some transformations, and we publish it in some API that will be consumed by everyone. So we want to democratize the data. So if a data analyzer said, I want the data, if a commercial said, I want the data, if someone said, I want data, um, I don't want to create a PDF, I don't want to create an STL, I don't want to create whatever. I want to say, okay, you have there the API, you can consume the data, and you can do what you want. So this is the idea that we have in an abstract way. So we have multiple providers, and we catch all the data that we have. We, uh, well, we have sources and we have providers. Some providers are external to us, and another provider uh, is ourselves. So we take the source, the data source, we provide, we put it in our system using loaders. We have one loader for each provider because each provider uh, give us the information in different ways. So we need to standardize this data to have a, a common schema. And then we have something interesting that it's the watchdogs. So watchdogs give us the traceability that in the, uh, another system we don't have. So if something is wrong, if we need to send alerts, metrics, or alarms about the data that we are receiving, OK, the watchdog will do it. And then the final step, the transformation, we transform the data about what we want, and we store inside our system. So another important thing, uh, all these steps, the loader, the watchdog, and the transformation is thinking like mini ETLs. So this big ETL is like a small ETL. Loader is an ETL, and it's, right, and it's containerized in Docker. The watchdog, again, it's a docker. And the transform, also, it's inside a docker. So we can move it to different environments. We can test it in a different environment. We can put it in production with one click. So it's very easy. So as I say, loaders, uh, something more specific. Loaders uh, simply uh, read from the providers and give us the data. So, and for that, we are trying to use, um, again, the cloud, the fancy cloud. Right now, we are using the systems, again, in our server. So it's not scalable. We have a lot of problems. So we say, OK, we need to be uh, a really company. So we're going to use cloud. We are using a uh, Google Cloud. And the loader, what does the loader? The loader. So, read the data and put it in Google Storage, our first data lake, and then send a PubSub message. OK, PubSub is a publication subscription, so it's very easy, a queue, a queue broker. And for that, we have uh, something that I like to match, that is um, asynchronous, asynchronous messaging, asynchronous dis distributed system. So then we have the watchdog. Watchdog, as I say, gives us the traceability, and we have something that is the statistical process control. Now we have statisticals about what is the quality of the code of the data we receive. We can create metrics, we can check the data if it's valid. If some provider give us an empty CVS, we can say, okay, something is wrong, of course. Uh, if some value could be a string or an int and it's a float, okay, this wrong, we can put alarms, and also we have a, a QA system, so QA system. So we can see if some of our values of QA 
uh, are incorrect or we need to modify something, we can modify it, let's say, on the fly. And also in this step, as we are working right now with uh, data sets in CVS, uh, this part convert these files into strings. So right now, instead of process everything in one batch, we say, OK, we convert in strings, and we are transforming it by demand. And this is the final implementation. So we have the loaders uh, running inside a Airflow container. So the Airflow is, uh, is helping us to schedule all the loaders because uh, each provider gives us the data maybe once a day, maybe once a week, maybe once a month. So uh, maybe we can put it, OK, we create a code job in a server and run this. OK, no, it's not scalable. So we use Airflow uh, using Google Compose. That's it, uh, a service that's software for Google Cloud. And everything is fine. And uh, it's written using pandas. So the logo is very fancy. It's, uh, it's a panda with a tree. So it's like uh, the statue in, in Seoul. So I don't know. <laughs> and OK, this one's uh, write the data in Google Storage and send a push of message. And then we have uh, Google Functions. Uh, it's like, I don't know if someone has used uh, Amazon, it's like uh, the Amazon Landas. So this function, if uh, see that we have a message in the push soup, at the moment, create a new Docker with the watchdog. The watchdog with this information in the, in the push soup, execute all the metrics, and create the new strings to be processed in the next step. And in this step, OK, we create metrics, we create uh, QAs, we create a lot of messages. What uh, do with that? So we send it to, to Elastic and Kibana to be processed by our data analytics and our, for me, for example, and since something is wrong, if something is working fine, and uh, make any changes if we need it. And also a self service. So it pulls it to another API, and if someone want to see it, okay. Use the API, please. OK, and the transformation. Maybe it's uh, where we're trying to do something different. So this is the part like I say, we're using the Django. Hey! No, now we're using Apache Bean uh, running over Google Dataflow. And OK, Apache Bean, I'm sorry, but Java for me is very boring. So we're trying to use uh, Spotify Steel that is writing in Scala. And it's, it's, it's very fancy. So if you never try it, I, I say, please, try Steel because it's cool. And then, OK, this is something that maybe we need to deprecate, but we store uh, all the data in Postgres. So here, we have a, a bottleneck. So right now, we are working on streams. Everything is very fast. But uh, we are not able to quite at this speed into Postgres. So for that, we need to create some Windows processing, Windows processing into a studio uh, and every 10 minutes do a, book of, a bulk of insert sequences into Postgres. So it's working again fine, but maybe we could be more faster. And also, we have an API that's with the data that we have in the Postgres. And we hope that everyone use this API. So uh, with this API and with Postgres, everyone can use it, for example, Carto to see all the data that we have there. They can use Tableau to see the data. They can use Jupyter to create some analytics or uh, the program that they want. So. The result is the only TL, four hours to process our data. And OK, this is important. I can say four hours. OK, four hours. But what is the size of the data frame? So maybe bigger, right? No, one gigabyte. So one gigabyte for four hours. <coughs> this is not big data. <laughs> so OK, we need to improve this because if we need to process more data, again, we are dead. So, and for each provider, four hours for each provider. <coughs> okay, horrible. Now, okay, 13 minutes, 
all the process. So download the file, uh, put the file inside the cloud. OK, we're going better. So right now, 87.5% uh, left of the time and the whole ETL. So I really believe that it's a good improvement. Good improvement. And if we saw all the values that we say in the data ops, so productive processing, we are reducing all the, all the code that we have. So yes, we are testing all the data. So we made some modifications. We run the test in the code and in the data to see that everything is fine. We're doing it. Version control systems, yes, we are using Git. Support several environments. Right now we have develop and we have production and we have another test system, right? Containerize, yes, Docker is cool. Deploy frequently, yes. If we make some modification, we can test it and if everything is fine, we can put it in production, perfect. Democratize data access. Again, we have our APIs, APIs, and if say we want to use this data, we can use the API, we can use everything you want, perfect. And measure your process. Again, I believe that. So, hey, hey, approve it. 24 months later, we passed the exam. And as we said before, uh, in our company, uh, lack of understanding, everything is ad hoc. So, okay, difficult to scale. So, it's, it's horrible. And right now, uh, I believe that. We have a common understability. We have really a product, a product to consume, a high rentability. The product is consistent. Everything is automated, and we validate everything that we do. Uh, low response is time. So if one guy asks us, we need the data for this thing, we can have the data in minutes, nor days or weeks. Uh, we don't have errors. Uh, no human more requirements, everything is automated again, and we can scale. So, so very quickly, just as a summary, you know, data analytics is a complex dis discipline, discipline, and data is a great framework to bring a bit of order in this chaos, and you have a framework of steps and best practices just to guide to the, to the goal, your process, it's more important that your tools, as you know, as you watch, we are not using fancy tools, just regular big data tools, but the process is key here. To have a common process and very well-known process inside a company was key for us. You need to use uh, software engineering best, best practices because it's the base, the foundation for everything, and finally, put a data ops engineer in your life. Everything can be done, everything can be implemented, because we have a data engineer a team, or in this case, a data ops engineering team. And that's all. Thank you very much. And um, please remember to rate in the mobile application. Just click the button, click the star and button. Thank you very much. Some questions? I'm not sure if we have enough time for questions. Okay, later. Thank you.